everyone, welcome to Epiphytic Cacti. Today I wanted to talk about Weberosirius radii. According to the Epiphyllum Society of America Registry of Species and Hybrids, Weberosirius radii is endemic to Costa Rica. It is epiphytic. The stems are terrate at the base, which just means that they are rounded and flattened above. They are fleshy, dull green, and the margins are crenate, which just means that the outer edge of the branches are scalloped. The outer petals are thick, pale pink, and the inner petals are white. I have a few Webo Sirius Bradii plants, and right now some of them are growing, but this one decided that it was going to start budding. It only had two buds on it that started forming indoors. One of the buds blasted and the other one, as you can see, just opened. It was pretty interesting actually because the, the buds on these have a very unusual sort of form. They have a very, very short flower tube. They, they're very um, shiny. They almost look like plastic. I expected it to, to stay quite a bit smaller, but it actually got surprisingly large. As did this flower. I didn't expect the flower to be quite as large as it is just because in photographs it generally looks smaller. And that might be because it is the only bud on this plant. It is the only flower on this plant. So it was able to put a lot more energy into this one single flower. If it had more, it is quite possible that they would have been varying sizes and some would have been quite a bit smaller. It was also surprising that it opened so quickly. There was no actual sign between the last time that I looked at it, what, which was a little bit earlier this evening when I would say it was probably about six. It had no signs whatsoever that I could visibly see that the flower was going to open. And the next time that I looked at it, which was probably some sometime after seven, it might've been about eight o'clock, the flower was open. So it happened very quickly and without any kind of real warning. So let's zoom in and take a closer look at the flower. Right now I have some slightly unusual lighting on this because it's a little bit hard to sort of pick up some of the, the coloration in the petals, mostly because the petals are somewhat translucent. Um, they have a, they have kind of an interesting shine to them and they're somewhat translucent. There is a lot of pollen in there. And if you can see, I mean, there's just a lot, a lot of pollen. And you can see basically like the size here, if I kind of turn it this way. There you go. You can see that the flower tube is very, very short. And you can see the, um, the, back, the back petals here, how they have like a little bit of a pinkish cast. And then as they get closer towards the tip of the bud, they would have been a little bit more yellow. And when this was closed, what you really saw was these outer, these back petals. And so it literally looked like plastic, the bud. Let's see if we can really kind of get in there. There you go. They, they have a certain way of basically like casting um, when the light hits them that you can see that there, there's a certain translucency to the petals more towards the tips. Otherwise the petals are really just, you know, more of a white color. I absolutely love this genus and I love this flower. It's so different, it's so unique, it's, it's just remarkable and just stunning. This is the first time that this has ever bloomed for me. I'm gonna check on this guy in the morning a little bit and then I'm gonna do a little bit of a follow up to show sort of some of the plant structure because this plant is really just one very large pad but I have several other plants that look a little bit different. There is something that I'm kind of noticing here that as this spotlight is on this flower as I'm recording this video, I am actually detecting that the flower is closing from the light. So I'm gonna turn these lights off, let the flower kind of do its, do its thing in its own course because this is, it is a night bloomer. Interesting, it's interesting that it's closing. This is actually just kind of a continuation. Of I just wanted to make sure that I actually showed some of the different plants so that we could get an idea of sort of like how it grows. And so this is actually one that I think last season I'd gotten it and it was just this single pad right here. Um, and I put it in my my standard epiphytic cacti mix that I put everything in. So here you can actually see that it started out, it had a tiny, tiny new growth coming out right here at the tip of this late in the fall last year. And it grew this whole thing right here indoors. And then it grew this whole thing also indoors. So this is actually from the fall 
do right now. You know, I keep these guys in a south facing window indoors that they grow at a very specific time. And if you don't give them like the adequate light nutrients and stuff that they need when they are choosing to grow, they won't grow as in, in an optimal way. So if this actually grows, and I'm noticing that it grows for me um, in the late fall through the winter and into the spring, that means I'm gonna be growing it indoors. So that means I need to put it in a place where it has like optimal light to growth, which has been a, a south window. And you can see what's really funny is that, you know, like, um, this is not truly an upright plant. It is actually something that is more pendant, but it will start upright and then like as it, it gets heavy, it'll start to hang down. I'm not gonna lie, there are times that I'm very concerned that this will just snap and break, but like I, you know, like I watch it kind of bend down and stuff and hopefully everything is okay there. I have noticed that the aerials um, down here seem to be getting, they seem to be changing. When they very first come out, there's no spines or anything like that, and they're they're not really fuzzy or anything, and I'm watching these kind of change like as they mature, and they're getting spines, they're getting fuzzy. And so, you know, I can see that when I look at the ones down here, I can see that these kind of grew out, and then I can see all of the aerials that they bloomed out of coming up. So it doesn't look like they bloomed out of the bottom ones, but it looks like they bloomed out of these. And so I'm going to guess here that when she's good and ready, she is basically going to start throwing blooms out of something like here. Um, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Maybe they'll come out down here and I'll be super surprised. I don't know. I think that the next one that I had purchased in my collection was actually this one. This is the one that bloomed. So she is looking a little, you know, dehydrated. That happens. You do notice that a lot. You just get a little dehydrated after blooming and stuff. There she is. You can see that there is kind of a remarkable difference in appearance between these two. For one, this pad is considerably bigger, but there's also just something a little different about it. I'm a little curious and excited to see that. I also don't necessarily know. And if you do know, please comment whether or not this is self-fertile. I heard a story recently claiming that it was self-fertile, that like after all these years, you know, it was proved that it was self-fertile. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but if you're wondering why I have so many of these, one of the reasons why I do that is because you don't necessarily know and because a lot of time there's not really clone information. So sometimes you can just get one plant that, or one species that has been circulated an awful lot. And if they're not self-fertile, that actually means that you have to have a different clone. So in the wild, you have to have two different specimens that were co collected to even be able to cross them to get a viable fruit and have viable seeds so that you can grow them from seed. So that's one of the reasons why I have multiples of some of these is because there's no information about how these were collected whatsoever. So when I see them, I just buy them. You know, hopefully at some point these guys bloom at the same time and then I can cross them. But it, like I said, if you do know whether or not this is self-fertile, please comment and you know, I'm gonna move these guys back just a little bit. And then I bought this guy here. I've heard some things that, that state that this is a little hard to grow. Um, I don't actually think that's true. I think that in my experience, having it is very easy to grow. I think that the only kind of catch is, is that it is, if you notice the pads, um, the segments here, they are, they're, they're quite thick. I think because of that, you, you can almost kind of infer that it's going to be one that is not necessarily going to like to be super wet. Like how wet this is right now is probably not great, but I've got super fast draining mix and I've been doing it for, for a while. But, you know, you can actually end up with the experiences of them rotting and stuff. I, I do know that once these guys start rotting, it's pretty difficult to get it to go any other way. Well, this is something that was interesting. I was a little surprised because I'd never really seen this before, is that these growths actually came out triangular. So this is a triangular growth, and this one is also kind of like weirdly misshapen. There was another pad here that was kind of odd, oddly shaped. It was like bent over and it was green when I got it, but it seemed very dehydrated. And it actually was something that I cut and then I put some cinnamon here on the wound and I had calloused and everything was fine because it started to rot from the end there. And then um, this guy has been putting on new growth throughout the winter, but like I think that the new growth on this guy is a little bit funky. It's then these new growth pads, they just seem very 
kind of oddly misshapen and a little bit strange in their coloration as though there is like some kind of deficiency happening. So these are two very recent ads. And you can see the, the pad on this one is actually considerably larger than any of the other ones that I have. Also excitement at the idea that this is probably a different clone than the ones that I have. But like, we'll see. You know, as time goes on, we'll kind of see what happens with these when they bloom and stuff. And shortly after that, I had also purchased this one. And you can see also, you know, much, much bigger, bigger pad on this. Um, so I'm excited about those guys. It's a plant that's a little bit hard to get. You get different kinds of uh, epiphytic cacti collectors, right? Like a lot of times an epiphytic cacti collector is going to be very, very into like one genus or a few genus, right? And so like for me, my favorite genus actually is Weber Rosarius. Here's the thing, right? Is that I noticed that like a lot of epiphylum collectors do not necessarily have Weber Rosarius because it's, it's not that big, showy, fancy flower. And because there are some things about species that I think deter people from collecting them. And one of the things is, is that those Weberoserius flowers, it, it blooms only at night and it blooms only that one night. So I think that a lot of times what ends up happening is that you will find that it is actually cacti collectors that you're going to find that have things like Weberoserius hanging around. And what's interesting is that it's almost never epith an epiphytic cacti collector. It's almost always like a desert cacti collector, you know, and I think it's because like they're collecting a lot of species and stuff, but like Weberoserius, I think is one that kind of fits, fits into their collections okay, because it seems to be something that is quite easy to, I think, grow, even in, even if you were trying to grow it alongside of, I think, some of your you know, desert dwellers, I think it would still be okay. Every single one of these, save one, came from a true cacti collector. And I believe that only one of these came from someone who was an epiphylum collector. One of them I found on Etsy and all four of the other ones I found on eBay. I have actually purchased these anywhere from, I think one of these I actually ended up getting for I think it was like like $27 or something like that. It was a bid, right? And I think because it's not the most sought after genus, like uh, it was something where I think I just happened to be the only person who was truly interested in that moment. So one of these I got for like $27. And then that was an amazing, an amazing kind of purchase. Um, but I think that every other one of these came anywhere between 100 and 150 dollars for any one any one single purchase they were all rooted so it, i didn't get any of these just as like a cutting all of them had roots of some sort it can be a little pricey if you find them okay. that's that's really kind of the spotlight on weber series birdie thank you for watching and happy cacti growing